This is the Kratom Science Journal Club with Dr. Jonathan Cachet, neuroscientist and expert in psychopharmacology. In each episode, we discuss an article in a peer-reviewed journal. I'm your host, Brian Gallagher, blog and social media writer for KratomScience.com, your source for all things Kratom. This week, we got a first-of-its-kind paper from the folks at University of Florida evaluating 11 kratom alkaloids after the administration of both lyophilized kratom tea and a commercial extract, and they're looking at rat plasma, and Dr. Abhishek Sharma shared this paper with me. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. So the study is pharmacokinetics of 11 kratom alkaloids following an oral dose of either traditional or commercial kratom products in rats. Uh, This came out recently in the Journal of Natural Products. It's from uh, University of Florida. I I sent Dr. Sharma, who was on the podcast, an email, and he sent this to me. It's not... He said it's going to be available via open access uh, a little bit later. Oh, good. But it isn't mm-hmm. right right now. There's just an abstract and some supporting material available that I'll put the link for. Um, but we got the we got the full Monty, uh, and um, so it's yeah it's University of Florida. Dr. McCurdy, Dr. Sharma. Um, funding they have is uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse from the grants they got from them, um, and it's their. University of Florida Clinical and Translational Science Institute um, that put this out. And basically, there's a little illustration there of what they did. And um, the uh, I like the illustration because it's, it's, mm-hmm. it, it helps when you have a hard time reading this, this stuff like I do. But there's a picture of Kratom. Then the rat gets it, oral dose. Then they take it out of the rat's plasma. Then it goes into a big machine where all the science happens. <laughs> and the science happens in the machine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's very much an uh, analytical chemistry sort of methodology paper. Yeah. And they're taking two things. They're lyophilized kratom tea, which they basically make from the kratom leaves to, I think, reflect the alkaloids that are in the leaves. Um, and we've talked about that before from from this same team and they're and, using uh, yeah, uh, a traditionalized sort of um you know a traditional uh consumption approach yeah yeah and and the other so they're giving these rats two different products um and the other one is an opms liquid shot i think everybody that takes kratom has heard of opms um mm-hmm. OPM. <laughs> That's kind of the uh, legal high lane of marketing. But I looked this up, and right. this stuff is, if it's the same product that they're using in this, this stuff is really strong. And it's like they even only recommend you take a couple of drops. Um, we can see in the um, in the charts that the that the uh, level of alkaloids are a lot higher than the in the uh, Kratom tea. Um, and so they're looking at 11 alkaloids here. And I, they said to their knowledge, um, uh, this is like the first study where they've studied all the alkaloids together. Uh, I think, um, I think it was, there. to the best of our knowledge, this is the first report that has simultaneously evaluated evaluated systemic exposure of 11 kratom alkaloids following the administration of traditional and commercial kratom products. So basically what they want to do is evaluate the alkaloids and see the differences the alkaloids of the alkaloids in the uh, liquid extract commercial kratom product versus the kratom tea. Uh, so I would say the systemic one is important in that they're looking at the, the pharmacokinetic is the, the sort of technical term, but they're looking at the yeah. distribution of these kratom alkaloids in a living organism um, via the, the blood plasm. And um, the method that they developed and put out um, is the simultaneously evaluated. So the, the fact that they are, they developed a method to, 
um, pull out the plasma, uh, purify it, and then run it through the uh, UPLC machine and, and get concentration levels from blood plasma. That's the, that's the unique aspect of this paper. Yeah, and they developed validated a bioanalytical, bioanalytical method for simultaneous quantitation. Not quantification, quantitation. Is, is that yeah, a, and, was that a misspelling or no? Is that no, a real I think word? You're right. I think it, okay. it's a, a, a difference in uh, for analytical chemistry. It's um, you know, and the other thing too is that uh, so not only so they were looking at the looking at it in the blood plasma. They were looking at them all at eleven at a time. Um, but the other thing that was important with the simultaneous analysis is they, they spent some time basically saying, you know, look, uh, most studies from a pharmaco pharmacology perspective have been analyzing single one off alkaloids. So just uh, metragenine or just the seven hydroxy, um, yeah. whereas this one was looking trying to essentially replicate a more natural consumption situation where you're not just taking single isolated alkaloids. Um, and they talk about they talk about um, I'm still kind of in the introduction the uh, minor alkaloid effects um, they they abbreviate them all for us and uh, uh, the one uh, Corey Nanthine or whatever it is core abbreviated abbreviated they said it actually is an antagonism at the mu opioid receptor. Um, Speciophiline uh, mm -hmm. is actually a more potent stimulant at the mu opioid receptor, and then panantheine and speciogenine inhibit twitch constant contraction in a non naloxone, non opioid receptor manner. So they inhibit, they calm the mouse's tails, <laughs> in, but in a way that doesn't act, these two alkaloids, in a way that doesn't act on the MOR. Um, which is pretty interesting. And so they, they kind of just list all what they know about the minor alkaloids thus far in the introduction there. And um, I think that we, you know, have spent uh, some time in, in past previous Journal Club episodes where we talk about the entourage effect. And I mean, essentially... Mm -hmm. That's what they're by replicating um, all eleven of these or looking at commercial products and then the the T. They're essentially trying to say, you know, all all of those effects that you just listed, presumably were discovered or found out in isolation. And so it's mm -hmm. in fact the like balance of uh, the metragenine with something that's potentially antagonistic at the um, new opioid that would lead to a slight variability in effects because if you're just taking the metragenine it's going to bind to the receptors and it's going to exert its effects but if you're taking it at a variable concentration with also an antagonist then there's going to be some mitigation or you know you could think the opposite way some enhancement of uh the way that all of these compounds work together and so um i think that was really um, I think that was really a, a major contribution. And the fact that they're looking at um, blood plasma concentration levels, that's systemic and that that's what's actually circulating through the organism's body. And then they, the method, the analytical method they developed, like can analyze all 11 of these rather quickly. Um, I think they, they cut the previous analytical time in half. And so moving forward, pharmacokinetic studies, which, of course, you know, the distribution of the, the drugs throughout the body um, and the effects that they have, um, knowing that and having a method to understand that in different organisms is quite a contribution to the overall, you know, study uh, of Kratom and, and its, um, you know, empirical efforts to understand it and its use cases. Yeah, yeah. When we have Dr. Sharma on, he was talking. He was talking about this study specifically, which hadn't been published. I think I interviewed him like two weeks before it came out. Um, but he was talking about how it's important to know that a lot of these studies just look at my tragenine, and my tragenine isn't kratom. They're different. It's kind of like THC cannabis. Exactly. We, and we talked about this, yeah, you know, a few times. And uh, so yeah, so you have to take all the alkaloids together, and and it's a good point they're making that some of these you know some that's why people get different effects from batch to batch because the alkaloid profile isn't exactly the same so you're going to get um not consistent uh results from batch to batch and product to product but this uh kratom leaf is they even say in the paper it's 0.5 to 1.5 
6.5% alkaloids. So the alkaloids are only one and a half, about 1% of the total leaf. Um, and this extract, there's a website, I'm looking at it, where it's 16.95 for this little eight milliliter bottle. And the one thing they did in this, which I was like, man, that's a that's a lot, was I think the human equivalent dose was a whole eight milliliter bottle. Which, I mean, it's called a Kratom extract shot, so when I, if I buy it and I don't really know much about uh, Kratom, I might be doing the whole thing anyway. So I actually have one here. Um, oh, okay. And it's a 50 to 1 extract. And so essentially, you know, they're distilling down what would be equivalent to almost like, you know, if you say 50 to 1, I don't know if it's actually 50 grams, equivalent to 50 grams, but... It yeah. is relative, you know, relative to other, to just taking the leaf or using a tea. Um, they do claim on the bottle that there is 118 milligrams of the metragenine uh, in the shot. And one of the things that I was, I was most, you know, looking forward to, to understanding where you were going with that human equivalency dose is, okay, you know, did they measure one batch of this this shot when they were in the manufacturing and it came out to this one 18 milligrams per bottle and then you know 20 30 40 100 batches later given it how widespread this product is is it actually still maintaining those levels and what was nice to see is that essentially um, the concentrations that they measured in the shot turned out to be about 103 or 104 milligrams in total over that eight, it's a it's a 8.8 .8 milligram shot. Um, so it does seem that they, you know, it is quite a lot, I would say for a novice Kratom user, I think for, um, individuals who are, uh, trying to transition off of opiates or have used, you know, common prescription opiates for years to handle, um, low dose pain that they, you know, if they would, if they're looking to uh, mitigate withdrawal symptoms and then perhaps find something that they could take to replace those instead of taking, you know, six, eight, 10 of these prescription pills a day, Yeah. then starting with something like this, um, you know, for, for someone who has, who has not used Kratom, it would be rough, but for, for someone who has is opiate experienced, um, I think that this would be, this would be somewhere where they want to be. And, and the, of course the nice thing about a shot from a method, method of administration point is that you don't have to take all of that leaf material. Um, yeah. Yeah. The one yeah, thing that yeah. you want to be worried about, what caught me off guard when I tried one of these, was that it is um, an alcohol-based extraction. And so if you're not expecting, um, you know, like uh, fumes of alcohol or ethanol, you know, like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like a strong vodka or like a 151, that can definitely catch you off guard. Um, so just be aware that that is the case. <laughs> I mean, it is a very concentrated uh, concoction, liquid concoction of kratom alkaloids. Another thing I highlighted about the entourage effect before we move on to the um, to the results here is the important thing to know is it says the metabolism of some kratom alkaloids could be altered by the presence of others. Um, mm -hmm. Pharmacokinetics of other kratom alkaloids could also differ when administered alone or as a mixture. Yeah, I just I guess I just wanted to point out it's kind of due to the the what happens in the metabolism um, because you know it's not just this does this this does this and when you take them together they do two things it's like they do different things it's a whole different beast when you take them together then right it's not just one plus one equals two for sure i'm glad you mentioned that too on the metabolism side because um you know yes we could just look at the mu opiate receptor and say well if you take an an, an agonist with an antagonist there could be some you know there's like math that happens to end up they don't act the same as if you were taking just just one on its own just like at the receptor, it's the same thing at any enzymatic degradation or, um, you know, metabolism that occurs in that maybe one of these uh, kratom alkaloids binds a little bit stronger to the enzyme and it's a little stickier. And because of that, like the other alkaloid doesn't really degrade as fast as it normally would or, or the, you know, the flip side, it could happen much faster. So it's, it's important to mention that um, on the metabolism side as well.
The previously reported method was not optimized for the analysis of plasma samples and had a relatively long runtime of 22.5 minutes. Uh, here we sought to decrease the runtime to minify, minimize the interference from the blank plasma. So what's the significance of runtime and why did they want to decrease it with their uh, new method? Great question. And, and it, it ties into metabolism a little bit. So. Let's just start first before we get into the metabolism and the kinetics of it. Let's just talk about just from a, a practical lab, you know, process. Yeah. So you have to extract the plasma. You have to get it into containers that won't like start coagulating blood. You have to separate the plasma. Um, and then once you actually get it into a form that you can push into the analytical chemistry machines. So this is a, a UPLC. It's very common. Uh, HPLC is another um, variant of it, but the, the UPLCs are generally more sensitive and can run, the runtime is faster. So runtime refers to uh, the amount of time when you inject a liquid for analytical chemical analysis to when it, like the beginning to the end. So within 11 minutes, it can analyze for all 11 uh, of the alkaloids uh, that they're targeting within that plasma concentration. Um, so just from a practical standpoint, you're cutting every single time that you want to, to do a measure and analysis, you're cutting that from 22 minutes down to 11 minutes. And so, you know, like in a cannabis lab, that can be the difference between um, 80 samples a day or like 150 samples a day. And generally in an analytical chemistry lab, the, the time is money. Um, mm -hmm. From a from a scientific standpoint, from a metabolism standpoint, you know there there is enzymes that are in the blood that contribute to the enzymatic degradation or the you know elimination of these active compounds from the blood, and so in this case, if you were to um, extract the blood and not put it into a specialized tube, it can start coagulating. And then if you left that overnight, for example, you would just end up coming back to a scab, something that you couldn't run through uh, the UPLC. Um, but even if, so, so you put it in a special tube, you prevent the coagulation, um, there can still be enzymatic degradation that occurs. So like generally, I think they were running four mice or yeah, four mice or no rats. They're using the Sprague Dolly rats um, at a time per like dose and response. And so you would have a rat in front of you. You would pull out a plasma sample before you gave them the dose. Then you would use the oral syringe to get it into their stomach. And then they had, you know, several set time points. And I don't know exactly what they were, but, you know, one hour post dose, 20 minutes post dose. So they were looking mm -hmm. at, you know, several, they were pulling blood at several different time points after the kratom was consumed. And so you can imagine that you have four rats in front of you, you're pulling this blood sample. So now you got four tubes of blood uh, at the, at the pre-dose. And then let's just say you were going to go five minutes after the dose. I think they probably waited a little bit longer, but then you pull out four more samples. Now you've got eight blood samples on the counter. And if you're going to stretch that all the way out to hours, you know, one hour, two hour, four hours, those samples that you took from the beginning that are like the enzymes are actively in, you know, interacting with the, the compounds, uh, uh, the target interest compounds, the alkaloids, then your results aren't going to be as accurate because essentially the ones that were pulled and just stored longer um, will have more time to go through enzymatic degradation. And so you're not getting a true indication or, or quantity of the alkaloids in the compound or in, in the plasma. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And and it has like on the one chart on table two, it's it's talks about the stability and it says bench top two hours, auto sampler twenty four hours, freeze thaw three cycles, and long term four weeks. And I think mm -hmm. the long term was kept at uh minus eighty Celsius, which is seems pretty cold. Uh <laughs> But, Very uh, cold. I mean, cold enough to where, you know, genetic activity is stopped. Um, essentially, it's like put into a state of biological hibernation. But yeah, I mean, so this stability test, I think, is often overlooked in in most sort of pharmacological aspects. I mean, there are some states in cannabis uh, programs where they have to look at the stability of the concentrations, because if you have an edible that sits on the shelf for eight months, 
but you have on the package that it was X amount of THC, but then by the time it gets to eight months, it's actually, you know, four times less THC and three times more CBN that changes the profile. And so, yeah, you know, I, I think that a lot of the pharmacolo- pharmacologists will overlook the stability, but when you're doing a study like this, you essentially have to just figure out what the stability is in these different storage conditions. So just on a bench top for two hours or sitting in the auto sampler where the liquid is pulled and then injected into the analytical uh, machine or these freeze thaw cycles, which essentially are, you know, uh, analyst comes into the lab, pulls samples out, does as many as they can over the course of the day, but didn't get to the last six, those have to go back into the freezer. And so if there's any change in that stability over that freeze um, thaw cycle, it changes your results significantly. Um, So they were very thorough in this, in looking at that stability to set a baseline to then look at how do these concentrations change over time based on their activity in the body. The chart on uh, page F, I think, it looks like it shows um, on the left, it's the regular Kratom tea. On the right, it's the uh, the um, extract shot. The mitragynine held at a certain level. This is like 25 hours after the the um, the extract shot. The, the alkaloids are still stable uh, in, in the plasma concentration for the extract shot. So you're looking at... The- yeah, the line, the bar chart where you're looking at um, plasma concentration on the uh, Y and then time in hours yeah. um, on the left. Yeah, and on, it looks like it, yeah, yeah, and it and it shows for um so for the four alkaloids are the only ones that were measurable. Um, uh, mitragynine, seven hydroxy, I think speciophylline and. Corey Nanthine, SPC and C O R. Um You're getting good at that, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh I mean the metragenine held at a certain level, but only like ten whatever uh nanograms per milliliter um twenty five hours after in the T, but everything else was gone by like ten ten, twelve hours. Um with the extract, all four of the alkaloids still held pretty much at their original levels uh, 25 hours later. I guess it's just due to the strength and the amount of alkaloids that are in the product versus the tea. It's a, it's a good question. It's a good question. At face value, it just essentially says the kratom alkaloids, when taken in this shot, um, remain at higher concentrations for longer, which would mean like, less redosing, um, you know, you, you wouldn't have to take it as often and you wouldn't have to take as much. Um, but, but looking at it now and, and how you're describing it, I mean, you, you do, you look at the, you look at the T and the metragenine is the blue line at the top. So it's found in the highest concentrations. And then over the course of the 25 hours, you see this gradual just sort of reduction in the plasma concentration, which is, what you would assume over time, the body, you know, metabolizes these compounds, enzymes degrade it, and it eventually is eliminated. Um, but with the, with the OPMS shot, you know, really there's like some degradation that occurs within the first up to five hours. And then after that, it's like literally just a straight line across. And so, you know, I don't know. I don't know exactly what this means. There's basically two things that I could hypothesize that are basically happening. The first one you mentioned, which would be the amount of alkaloids is so high or so much higher that um, the the rate at which your body degrades them or eliminates them is not happening fast enough for you actually to to met like to see a, a physiological difference in the elimination of this stuff so it's so high your body can't degrade it and get rid of it um at at the same rate but it's the flat line that that has me kind of you know and it it should be going down concentration over time should be going down Mm -hmm. so if the enzymes are maxed out and can't degrade um that quickly then it would just be sort of a flat line across and you know we should mention too that this is an exponential log scale um so the numbers you know we could have gotten up to 100 and then it goes down to 60 and like maybe over time it goes from like 
you know, 60 to, to 50 to 40. And it's just a sort of a difficult to see that in the line. Um, the other thing would be though, um, and I don't know, this is just a hypothesis, but there could be potentially something that in the process of making these liquid extract shots, the metragenine is somehow stabilized and resistant to uh, enzymatic degradation um, to the extent that the, the sort of natural right out of the leaf tea form um, would be. Um, you know, I, I don't know which, which one it is. I mean, like I said, the practical interpretation is it lasts longer, um, but it doesn't make sense to me that the concentration would just flatline over the course of 24 hours. We very rarely see drugs that have half-lives that are that long. I mean, the benzodiazepines are some of the longest, um, yeah. but you would still see a, a reduction over time. Um, so it, it's, 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 it's good to understand what this time course looks like, but when you try to you know, take that beyond just a practical or functional interpretation of it lasting longer, it's difficult to hypothesize why that may be. You, you were talking about the second column of text on that page? Just The page above that on uh, E, but yeah. With, okay. uh, with, so it's basically just like letter, 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 number, yeah. plus or minus number, letter, 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 and it's, <laughs> it's sort of tough to actually follow. Yeah, yeah. It's like an alphabet soup over there. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. The whole... <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically the whole page. But uh, I'm looking at uh, table two. Now, is the second set of numbers, like on the row, that would probably be the uh, the uh, extract, and then the first would be the T. Is that right, or am I looking um, at that so wrong? So this is stability of kratom alkaloids under different storage conditions. I, I think that they were probably looking at the alkaloids um in isolation so they had to make standards right so when you're doing any sort of like analytical chemistry you have to have a standard which is like a, a very um very specifically prepared liquid that has a known amount of uh concentration in it so like they have for the uh, metragenine, they have nominal concentration of 2.5 nanograms per milliliter, and then they have 160 nanograms per milliliter. And when you have a known concentration, you usually set up a, a few different concentrations between 2.5 and 160, then you can make yourself a line graph and then get an equation for that line to then um, actually calibrate what your, your test sample is. So you have known amounts that have a set concentration, you run those through the machine, you establish a, a best fit line, and then you get the equation for that line. So then when you run a test sample, um, you, you know, you'll get your, you'll get your absorbance or your retention length, uh, and then interpret that to be a concentration by using that calibration curve. Um, so I think in this case, <clears throat> they, uh, in table two, at least, they're not necessarily comparing the T to the uh, commercial shot. They're just looking at the alkaloids um, stored like in as standards and then at different time points. Yeah, yeah. And, and it also said my tragedy was the major alkaloid in both preparations. While most of the alkaloids were detected in varying contents, but the relative content normalized to my tragenine in each preparation was comparable. So what does normalized to my tragenine mean? That's a, a, a good question. So in the supplemental materials, they, I don't know if you have that handy, but there's table uh, on, yeah. S2. Um, and so basically what they're saying is in the OPMS liquid, the measured uh, milligrams per milliliter was 11.81. And so if you set that, at 100% and okay. all of the rest of the alkaloids as relative to the metragenine, then you um, can compare between the two different commercial products. So like you basically say the top line for metragenine is at 100%. Um, in the shot, it was at 11.81. In the T, it was 1.57. But if you set both of those as the top of 100, then you can compare across the two different um, concentrations. Because essentially, I mean, if you didn't do that, the OPMS liquid has essentially 10 times more metragenine than what the T does. 
And if you try to graph those concentrations using the absolute value of what those concentrations are, the T would be so much lower and the OPMS look would be so much higher. So you have to get them relative to each other. And that, so you, you, multi, you, you assume that the metragenine is 100% or the 1.0, and then everything else is uh, relative to that. Yeah, that makes sense. And and another thing in looking at the charts and stuff, and I think they point this out, was that the uh, seven hydroxy concentrations actually increase in the first two hours, um, which well, I don't know. So does metragenine, mitra- but uh, the one they point out. I mean, it's it's they're pointing out that the seven hydroxy. Uh, I mean, my tragenine metabolizes into 7-hydroxy, and I think I pulled that quote out, and I can read it. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I was going to mention that, too. We talk about yeah. enzymatic degradation in, in previous episodes. And so, like, this idea that there would be so much metragenine that it just wasn't enzymatically degraded it doesn't seem very likely because there isn't, like, there's one specific enzyme for this one specific compound, it's that entire family of those cytochrome enzymes that are like very broad generalists in terms of their degradation. But yeah, the what you, where you're getting at, the um, some of the metragenine could be degraded into the seven hydroxy metragenine, and that would cause an increase, you know, plus or you know, plus one hour, plus two hours. Yeah, here it, even though the actual dose of 7-HMG was negligible, there were measurable amounts of 7-HMG as observed in the plasma. Plasma. These data are consistent with the metabolism of MTG into 7-HMG. So, and I think, like, essentially, which is why powder kratom has more than fresh leaf, is you're just adding uh, some oxygen to it. And I mean, I don't know if it's that simple, but uh, yeah. that's, that's kind of okay. how it why it has I think that's kind of what happens in the metabolism as well if, if I'm understanding it right yeah yeah I mean the, the organic chemists in the audience uh, might have a little bit you know a little bit of a uh, concern with how you describe just adding that hydroxyl group but yeah. um, you know I'm certainly not I haven't taken organic organic chemistry in almost a decade now so I you know I couldn't tell you mechanistically exactly how that happens but I remember okay doing a lot of those problems in OCHEM. Um, the method development and validation, they're describing the instrumentation and the analytical conditions. In these analytical chemistry instruments, there are different columns. And the column is where uh, the, the like target analyte compounds are run through. And you can change the properties of that column, how wide it is, what it's lined with on the inside. Is it for hydrophobic compounds? Is it for hydrophilic compounds? You know, I I become a little bit of a fish out of the water on the exact nature of the differences in those columns, but you have to very much specify which column you used um, if anyone has any chance of replicating, you know, these studies. Then after that, so they describe exactly like the settings on the machine, what solvents they were using, what the run times were set at, what sort of um, the mobile phase, which is like, you know, basically you inject your sample and then this, then additional liquids come in and mix with it so it can separate things out. Um, the temperatures at which they're run at, the voltage. Then they go into how they made the calibration standards. Um, so that was what I was essentially describing with a set known amount um, over different concentrations. So you can set a a calibration curve. Um, And then beyond that, so that, you know, sample preparation, how they actually uh, went from the blood to what they were able to inject in there. But then this this selectivity, specificity, carryover, sensitivity, um, recovery and matrix effects, accuracy and precision, uh, and stability are all um, very important quality control steps when you're doing this type of uh, of analytical chemistry. Um, so let's just, you know, we'll pick one, for example, um, carryover. So if you're running uh, several different samples of something, and we'll go to a cannabis one just because I think it's a little bit easier to understand. Um, if you're running, like, let's say, six different types of cannabis grown by two different um, cultivators and you run the first two 
Um, and then some of those cannabinoids get stuck in the line or in these columns and it's carried over to the next samples that are run, um, then it'll affect your results. You, you'll have higher concentrations in the you know, latter samples that you're running that day because cannabinoids, or in this case, it would be the kratom alkaloids are carried over from one sample to the next. And so there's a series of uh, evaluations that you can do to make sure that carryover isn't happening, you know, basically, mm -hmm. and there's probably tons of different ways to actually do this, but you would like run a sample and then maybe run that sample again. And then you would just run a blank sample. And so the blank sample should have none of the target alkaloids in it, but if it does, then some amount of carryovers have, um, and you have, like I said, you have to eliminate that if you want accurate results, but like what you'll find is that, okay, we've got to do one sample, then we got to run a blank, then we got to run through some solvent that will completely remove it through, and then we can run another sample through. Um, and the same thing happens with uh, like recovery and matrix effects. The matrix effect describes the interference from everything else but your target analyte um, that you're looking at. So like in this case, let's say it's metragenine. You want to know that the plasma and the enzymes and all of the other molecules in that concoction um, are not like causing noise in the machine that if, that either causes you to over quantify or um, under quantify the amount of your kratom metragenine alkaloid, your target mm -hmm. analyte. And so the matrix effect is just like uh, the noise from whatever your target analyte is in uh, that can that can affect your quantification. And so just to take it to another example with cannabis, um, in cannabis edibles, there are so many different like types. You've got candies that are like essentially sugar and corn starch. You've got um, brownies or cookies that are like sugars, carbohydrates, so, so much other stuff. Then you've got just tinctures, which are the cannabinoids and then oil. You've got drinks that are cannabinoids and then, you know, like carbonated water and soda. So there's so many different matrices that you're just looking to measure the amount of THC in that it can be very difficult. And it was in the early years for cannabis labs to um, essentially strip out the matrix entirely and reduce the amount of noise that you're getting from that matrix so you can accurately quantify how much THC or other cannabinoids are in it. Mm. And so, um, you know, when I said that this is a very heavy analytical chemistry paper, and yeah. I would really say more than anything else, this is methodology development. And so that's why they went into such detail on every single one of these like critically important quality control steps for analytical chemistry. Um, and then publish that because now another lab can pick up where they left off, um, verify that they, you know, they do all of these different steps. And I mean, this could take months to go through this entire process, yeah. if, if not longer. Um, and so this, this, this paper very much provides the analytical chemistry community with a roadmap in which you can uh, do this quick quantification of uh, up to 11 of the different alkaloids. And like, yeah, you said it could take months, and is is that why, I mean, it's probably impossible for a lot of these vendors to even have, like, an alkaloid profile. I mean, they could test it for contaminants maybe pretty easily, but to have, like, an alkaloid profile um, that's ac as accurate as this would is probably out of the reach of most vendors, would, would you say that? Yeah. And generally that's why you would um, have a third party analytical lab perform, um, you know, to get your certificate of analysis. I mean, there are, and it, probably not in this case in Kratom and in that there are tests that can be done, let's say when you're making edibles that you can test the amount of cannabinoids in your edible, like while it's being produced. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't really matter. All you want to know is like, is this, five milligrams of THC or is this 20 milligrams of THC? Um, it, it very big numbers, very granular when it, when we're speaking from the perspective of analytical chemistry, mm -hmm. when you 
when you get to this level, you know, we're talking about the difference between 0.00001 versus 0.00002 um, <laughs> is the difference uh, in, the, in the precision of these types of analyses. So yes, I mean, when you got to do a certificate of analysis, A, you want a third party to do it because uh, there's an incentive for the manufacturer to uh, inflate the numbers. Um, but B, it would be almost an impossible standard for, to have like, they've already got to worried about like, okay, where are they getting their Kratom from? Where is the Kratom being stored just as leaf? How clean are the vessels they're putting it in before they're doing the extraction? You know, make sure there's no molds or mills dues or other contaminants just in their extraction equipment to get it down to a shot. Um, and then to ask them to follow these good, clean manufacturing practices on top of being, you know, precise enough that would be like a certified or ISO certified analytical chemistry lab. It's not unheard of. And I'm sure pharmaceutical companies have to meet those standards. Um, yeah. But in this case, it's best to just be to, to use that third party who this is what they do day in, day out. I guess the only other question I have, I'm looking at these uh, chromatograms and there's a uh, the y axis is 0 to 100% and I'm not sure what the x axis is it's 0 to 10 um but w what does that exactly measure they look I mean there's like blips on it for and for right. each um for each alkaloid they're showing where the blips lie on the on the uh on the chromatogram Right. So um, chromatograms are showing retention time along the x-axis. Typically, these ones are retention time. Um, and the 0 to 100% is based on your calibration curve. And so these peaks, um, based on where the peak appears after the retention time, gives you an indication of what compound it is. And then the you know, zero to 100 is how much of that compound is actually in there. And so these are representative chromatograms of the 11 alkaloids. And you know, if you, um, let's just say we look at, I'm trying to see if metragenine and 7-hydroxy are on the same. They're not. But let's just go with the first one in the green. So you see metragenine and then SPG and SPC. Uh, um, Based on the molecular weight and the properties of that moving through the column I was describing, it'll be held into that chromatogram. Uh, it, it'll be held in the column or take longer or a shorter amount of time to go through that column. And it allows you to identify things. I mean, when you first learn about um, chromatography uh, in chemistry, they essentially describe it was developed by a guy who was looking at different plant pigments in flowers. And so you imagine like a column full of a bunch of beads. When you pour this like blended mixture of, let's say, flowers and leaf together, you'll notice that the green separates from the red, separates from the yellow at different rates. And that's essentially what we're doing just now on a micro scale in these columns. You're separating the molecules based on a difference in physical properties. And so it could be molecular weight. It could be pH, it could be attraction or repelling from, you know, hydrophobic or hydrophilic uh, beads. And, and that's where all the variation comes in, in the, in the columns. And so, um, yeah, basically this is just retention time and uh, where the, where they call the peaks eluding from the column at. Um, and you can imagine, like, I'm assuming that these representative, uh, chromatograms are actually run um, on samples, although it does say plasma. So they might've done like a, a standardized sample in blood plasma um, and did them all separately. In reality, it would be all of these peaks on one chromatogram and they wouldn't all go to hundred percent in the actual test ones and representative ones, you know, that's, that's fine to illustrate it that way. And especially if it's the standard curves. Um, but mm. when you run like, you know, rat one plasma, you know, zero hour sample, it's actually all of those peaks on one column. It can, uh. the chromatograms, like it can take you a long time to get used to them, especially because there's so much variation in what those columns are. And like, yeah, you know, it's, uh, if you're running cannabis, it's, it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic. If you're running like pesticides or you're running like some other environmental contaminant, it could be solely based on pH where like 
The beginning of the column is a very low pH, very acidic, and the bottom of the column is very basic environment. And so based on the, you know, the properties of that particular chemical you're looking at, it'll s- separate them out. And I mean, that's, that's at the core of any of these HPLC, UPLC. Um, they run through a column to separate the different molecules from each other as distinctly as possible so you can measure them all accurately individually. Yeah, yeah. And and like you said this is this whole study is kind of like uh kind of lays the groundwork for more studies to come. So, it's kind of it's really it's kind of exciting to be at the to be monitoring the the beginning of all this uh kratom research that's going to be going to be around for sure. for a while is in a, a growing industry. Yep. Science is step by step, um, and these little steps are really what you know you build upon and and move forward. Um, it's just funny graph that they show most graduate students when you get to a PhD level program where it's like this big circle, and the circle is the boundary of what is known, like the edge of known science, and then they zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and they just show this little blip on the edge, and they go, if you can just contribute to that little blip. You know, you're you're doing your job. Don't think that you're just going to make a huge expansion in the in the boundaries of that circle. You're just going to push it a little bit forward in your area of expertise. And that's a contribution, you know, uh, collectively, of course, it, it is what pushed that boundary forward. But individually, I think a lot of people can get to grad school and think, uh, you know, very uh like manic thoughts about how they're going to change the world. And sometimes that happens if you're Einstein, but normally yeah. <laughs> it's uh, li- baby steps at a time. Well, that's cool. That's, that's, that's a good uh, way to look at it with, with any, any field you're in podcasting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anything, but yeah. Okay, cool. This is good. And uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Abhishek Sharma for sharing this with us. And, um, yeah, we'll do another one next time. Keep up the work down there in at Florida. Appreciate what you guys are doing because you guys are really the one. You know, your groups are the ones that's putting this stuff out. And and like you're saying too, like um, you know, they say it at the very end of the discussion. But now that they've proved this in rats, it can be done in other uh, model organisms, and it could be done in humans because you're just drawing the blood and then testing it. And so, if there's any um, foreseeable future where people are you know considering that kratom would be used in a pharmaceutical or therapeutic like setting beyond what it is currently being used in um having the the technology and techniques to do these type we do a lot of pharmacodynamics when we're talking about the papers like what receptors is it bind to how does it change the receptors but just as important is the pharmacokinetic so how does it move through the body Thank you, Dr. John Cachet. Check him out on social media at Jay Cachet. Please like, subscribe, comment. Journal Club is every other week. Kratom Science Journal Club is produced by me, Brian Gallagher, for KratomScience.com. Take care.